This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Fully embody your highest values, lead with compassion and generosity, and create soul-nourishing workplaces that become forces of good in the world. Valeria Tellez interviews Carly Hauck, the author of Shine, Ignite Your Inner Game to Lead Consciously at Work and in the World. Carly Hauck is a learning architect, leadership development consultant, author, speaker, and serves as adjunct faculty at Stanford University and UC Berkeley Haas School of Business, teaching on the subject of leadership and business as a platform for positive change in the world. For the last decade, she has served hundreds of leaders and companies in Fortune 100 companies and high growth startups such as LinkedIn, Gen and Tech, Pixar, Cliff Bar, Intuit, Bank of the West, etc., to up level their leadership skills, cultivate their recipes for resilience, and create thriving workplaces and mission driven businesses. Carly feels inspired to guide leaders with a new skill set of tools to support the next paradigm of conscious leadership and business that is emerging in our changing world. In her upcoming book, Shine, Ignite Your Inner Game to Lead Consciously at Work and the World, Carly guides readers on a transformational inner to outer journey to inspire a new workplace and world that works for everyone and prioritizes people and planet first. Carly's writing and work has been featured in Mindful Magazine, Conscious Company Media, 15.5, and Emerging Women. Additionally, Carly is the host of the Inspiring Shine podcast. She interviews leaders on the practices and tools they use to rise amidst adversity lead with authenticity, love, and influence business to be a force for good in the world. Meet Carly at carlyhauk.com. Here is the interview with Carly Hauk. In your own words, who is Carly Hauk? Beautiful question. I think what I'll share are the qualities that come to mind that probably are ones that have been reflected back to me over and over again by friends, family, colleagues, courageous, resilient, compassionate, spiritual warrior, climate activist, healer, teacher, lover, planet guardian. There's something that you wrote in your book that I really like that includes sort of that component of life, spirituality. You say that you share methods uh, for learning to full embody our highest values, lead with compassion and generosity, and create soul-nourishing workplaces. So that is my next question. What is the soul And what is spirituality to you? I've never been asked these questions. (laughs) (laughs) They're they're so potent. They just drop me really far deep into my body. The soul feels like the essence of who we are. And this essence is continually being refined over time, over lifetimes. I, I do believe in 
multiple lifetimes if we're lucky. You know, we, we continually get an option, a chance to really be better than we were in the last life. And I'm very much aligned with the purpose of this life right now. I, I, I can very much feel why I'm here in this form in this lifetime right now. So that, that answers the soul as best as I can at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And spirituality, you know, I, I consider myself spiritual versus religious. And I think what that means for me is that I'm connected to the divine and I'm connected to Gaia. So I'm connected to the powers and the energies above, but also below. And by staying in connection and in conversation and in reverence, that helps to have me lead in greater balance and greater harmony and greater alignment. That's how I define it for myself. Yeah, it sounds really good to me. Do you ever use the word God? I really love the word divine. I, you know, and, and divine could encompass Jesus, Buddha, Ganesha, uh, Shiva, you know, it, it, it's kind of all of those things. But when I feel into like the higher collective consciousness for me, it's the divine. And I, the divine also has a feminine connotation for me. And I'd like to believe she's feminine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like now that you say it, that's interesting. I never thought about that. But it sounds more feminine than the idea of God, the word God. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. A feminine with a, with a beautiful masculine, right? It's in balance. Yes. So my next question is about leadership. What is your own definition of leadership? Well, I don't believe that we have to have a title to be a leader. And so when I think about leadership, I think about the thing that you really want to change in the world, in your workplace, you know, and it could be something small, but it's really this opportunity for you to be the change, to lead whatever that action, that calling, that initiative is that is going to hopefully make the world and the people in your life better. What do you think are the greatest misconceptions about leadership? I think often that people think that they have to be awarded the title, that they have to be asked to lead, that they can't lead without that authority or without permission. And I know we're going to get to, you know, my book shortly, but one of the leaders that I highlight in the book, and I would actually say probably all of them at various points had not been given a title, but one particular leader that I love, 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 and I just feel so aligned with her and her mission. And her name is Rhea Singhal. And she started India's first compostable tableware company. And she started this company at the age of 28 because she saw that there was no waste segregation system in India. And there was just tons of trash going into these landfills that was impacting everyone's quality of life. And she felt sick that there was no solution. And so she decided she wanted to do something about it. She didn't have any background in compostables, but she figured it out. And her impact in the world has been absolutely outstanding. And the positive ripple effects that that one decision of her deciding to be a leader has made not only on India, but in the world. That makes me think about accessing our unique purposes or purpose in life. So with that in mind, what is your unique purpose at this time? I feel grateful that I even know what that is because I think <laughs> <Yeah>. at time, <laughs> and I think many of the people that I coach and that I work with, you know, they, they haven't identified what that is. But for me, it's, it's healing. Um, I am, I am a healer and the healing that I am being brought to convey and to support in this lifetime is healing the workplace, healing the world, um, really bringing people into greater harmony. And that starts with 
the individual, you know, really helping people to realign with balance, with joy, with well-being, so that they can support that greater collective transformation and healing. And as you had said before, you know, support these more soulful driven organizations that want to be a force for good in the world. And I often ask the question, what healing is, if there is such a thing as being healed as a destination? Do you believe that? I feel like we're always healing. Yeah, I don't feel like it, it's ever <laughs> the final, uh, whatever, the final frontier. I, I think that there's, there's layers and layers of healing. And we're in such a huge opportunity for that right now, as we are seeing more and more than ever how, how in it we are together. You know, we are, we are not separate from each other. We are not separate from the earth. And we're really looking at the things that are wounded, that are maybe broken. I don't think we need to look at ourselves or the world as needing to be fixed. But I do believe that we are engaging in some massive healing that has not ever been done at, at the level that it needs to be now. What do you think the purpose of the human experience is? Well, the word that immediately comes is to love. It's, it, it, I feel like that's the most potent frequency that we have access to as human beings. And how can we love ourselves? Because it really starts with us first, right? If I'm not loving myself, if I'm not loving all the parts and forgiving and accepting those parts, then how can I really love others when they're messy and reactive and they yell at me and, you know, they're having a hard day. But I really think it's to love greater and better and more deeply. So self-love, that is a, you call them inner game skills. And you do have that one under well-being. It's one of them, the fifth one and you have self-care. So what is the difference from your perspective between self-care and self-love? Well, self-love is really this well wishing for myself of wanting myself to be healthy, to be happy, to you know, be in greater balance, whatever that is, to rest, to you know, have love in my life. So that, that's self-love, really identifying what fills that, you know, love bubble or love well or whatever we want to call it up. And then I believe self-care is an extension of that self-love. So I have to talk about, you know, the, the two nuances and distinctions of loving kindness and compassion. So loving kindness is this well-wishing for myself, for others. And when that is there, it is natural to be compassionate, to bring self-compassion and compassion to others. And I often like to think of compassion in action. So the self-care could be recognizing that I love myself and I've worked really hard today and I'm going to actually make sure that I end early, get off Zoom, you know, speak to someone I care about and go to bed. Do you think it's possible to love others if we don't yet love ourselves, so accept ourselves fully? I think we can love others when they're being pleasant. <laughs> That's <laughs> easier. Much easier. But right. when, <laughs> when someone gets triggered, when there's an upset, when there's an unpleasant response, and we're not loving ourselves and we're not being compassionate to ourselves, when that other person is not being how we want them to be or not loving us in the way that we want or how we want, then we can retract that love because we want them to show up in a certain way versus recognizing they can't show up in a certain way. This is how they are right now. This is what we get right now from this person. And they're messy just like I am. But if I can love myself and turn towards that hurt or that ouch um, with compassion, then I can actually tend to that. And I don't need anything from that person in that moment. And then I can actually have compassion for them and see them from this greater perspective of, you know what, this isn't personal. 
they're just having a rough time. Oh, I love that understanding. When did you discover this? Um, yeah, this. I mean, to me, it's uh, the most amazing um, way to live. Mm-hmm. Kind of analyzing yourself, being aware of how the way you think and react or respond to anything and being able to be compassionate when it's, uh, when it's challenging. How did you come to this understanding, Carly? So I started a meditation practice when I was 19. And I started a meditation or a, a yoga practice when I was 17. And so those practices have been a real foundation for me in my life. And they support me to cultivate greater self-awareness. And so really being able to recognize what's mine, what thoughts are causing these actions and, and even the energy that's being returned to me because of what I'm putting out into the world and just really learning how to have, and I'm still growing in this, Valerie, you know, I (laughs) mean, oh yeah, all of us. Yeah. I mean, even last night I was recognizing that based on some conditions and things that have been happening in my life and are still present, I was um, feeling a little defeated and I was talking to one of my friends, a a very close colleague of mine who I used to teach at Stanford with. And I didn't really want to talk to him because I didn't have a story that I thought was very (laughs) empowering in the moment. And then I just really looked at that and thought, okay, take responsibility for this. Like you're putting this out into the world, this story, this thought, you can't do anything about it, but put one foot in front of the other and shift your energy. And so going back to your question, you know, I I have to start with really seeing myself, seeing where I'm getting stuck, seeing the patterns and having a lot of compassion for that. And then deciding, I don't want to do this anymore. Let's change this. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? When I think of the times that I'm most free in my life, it's when I'm feeling tethered to something or someone or some people that I care about, but I have the ability to roam around and then I come back. So like for me, a few weeks ago, I was in Sedona, Arizona, which has been a spiritual home for me on many levels. I was going to grad school just above Sedona and started attending um, and spending time there in my, in my mid twenties. So that was over 15 years ago. And then I just felt so happy and free and joyful because the trails there are just so delicious to run and hike. And the rocks are amazing. And it's just an image of freedom for me, but I felt really grounded and tethered to the land and then to my sense of safety, my sense of security, and even the community that I was getting to engage with in Sedona, which are some some really dear humans in my life. So all of that kind of the combination of feeling tethered and connected to certain things that help me feel cared for and secure and stable, but then also having this room to expand and grow and deepen and play. So you wrote the book, Shine, Ignite Your Inner Game to Lead Consciously at Work and in the World. Two questions. How did you become a writer and what was the inspiration and intention of writing this book? Thank you. Thank you. Even as you said the name, um, I have some tears actually (laughs) in my eyes. Like Mm. (laughs) I'm, uh, it's, It's been such a labor of love, Valerie, to write this book. (laughs) I can imagine. And I've been writing it for three years and it's coming (laughs) February 23rd, 2021. And I feel like a mama. You know, (laughs) this is my first like real birthing. (laughs) But I've always been a writer. I've been a writer since I was a little girl. Uh, I've always been, you know, interested in journaling and self-reflection and took a creative writing class. And it's funny, I don't think of myself as the best writer, but it's, it's been, I guess, the easiest channel for me to express my thoughts and my beliefs and 
my desires uh, for this world and for people. And this book came about because when I was at Stanford, my first semester of teaching there, I had a acquisitions editor who disguised herself as a student and she emailed me and asked me if she could come to my class and just um, be a guest. And I didn't know any better than to say yes. So I mm-hmm. said, yes, you can come <laughs> to this class. And she did. And at the end of the class, she came up to me and then she revealed herself and said, Carly, I'm an acquisitions editor at this publishing house. Your class and material is you know, really impressive. Have you thought about writing a book? And I said, who has time to write a book? <laughs> right. <laughs> and she said, well, I really think you should consider it. And so I, I just kind of, you know, I thought about it and I thought I, I was still really trying to build my business at the time. I was working very, very hard. I couldn't even imagine writing a book, but I talked to my uncle and he said, Carly, you've been writing since you were a little girl. Um, and he's a writer. And he said, you you need to start writing. I want you to start blogging. So I started blogging. I started blogging actually to my fitness pal at first for about a year. My writing did incredibly well there. And then I started writing for Mindful Magazine and then also Conscious Company. And all my writing was very well received and people really loved it. And then two years later, uh, the same publisher came back to me and they said, we really want you to write a book. And I thought, okay, here I go. <laughs> and Shine was not the book that I started writing. Um, I started writing a book on resilience, but that was not the book that I was supposed to write. And so the reason that I wrote Shine is because I wrote this book for the time that we are in right now. Um, I started writing Shine when Trump was elected. And I saw where we were headed as a humanity, which felt like we were headed off a cliff that we were never going to be able to come back from. And I deeply would love to see humanity and the planet come to a place of flourishing, but that is going to require a lot of inner work. Um, And that inner work creates the collective transformation that we are seeing ourselves with such a huge opportunity for. And so Shine is really about how do we up-level our inner game, cultivate certain qualities of consciousness so that we can create a workplace in a world that works for everyone and is living in greater harmony with the planet. And I highlight how each of us can do that in the book with different practices and skills. And these are practices and qualities I've been working with leaders and managers for the last decade. So I know that they really work. They're also ones I myself do as best I can to embody. And then I highlight nine leaders, Rhea Singal being one of the leaders I spoke to earlier, who are really leading consciously at work and in the world. And they're using these qualities to support them in that. So you say accessing the best in yourself requires embracing all of your parts and identities. And then you also said, we must have the dark and light to truly shine. Mm -hmm. This is so true. Talk to me about these insights. How did they come to you? Well, I've been looking at my own shadow for many years um, in order to, again, as you shared, embrace all of my parts. Because we all have parts. You know, we have the parts that are shiny that we like to show off. You know, when you asked me about uh, who am I, I shared with you the qualities I like about myself. I didn't share with you the ones that are darker because that's, you know, those are the ones that come through the best. But do I also have parts that are impatient? Yes. Do I have parts that are critical? Yes. Do I have parts that are judging and judgmental? Yes. Do I have parts that are self-righteous? and selfish and arrogant. Yeah, I do. And that's just part of being human. But the more that I deny that I have those parts, the more that I make myself wrong, that I shame them, then I can't fully accept or embrace anybody else. Because if I deny those parts in myself, then what's probably going to happen, and this has been my experience, is that 
people show up with those parts that I have not actually embraced in myself. And then those are the people <laughs> that I get triggered <laughs> by. <laughs> right, right. And that's I go, often true. You're wrong. Or you have this that's not okay. But you know what? So do I. I have that part. And so in this journey of healing, you know, individually and then collectively, we're trying to create a world where everyone feels included, where we're not oppressing, we're not marginalizing, we're not shaming. We have a long way to go. We're not there yet. But I do believe that this cultivation of embracing and accepting the inner and the dark. I like to think of this as the inner belonging. I'm really belonging to myself and I'm really embracing all these parts. And from the inner belonging creates the outer belonging. So you connect authenticity to that. I'm wondering when and how do we know when we are there being authentic? Do you have some ideas? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Great that you do. I would love to hear that. <laughs> We all wanted to know more about authenticity, I guess. Well, for me, authenticity is really accessed when I'm still, when I'm quiet, when I'm really listening to what's true. And so another way of saying that is what is my yes? What is my no? And those things shift and change over time. Um, We could think of that as preferences, but if you think about something that like you wish that you had said yes to, but you said no because you were trying to be pleasing or, you know, you were trying to maybe go into um, work mode or whatever it is where you weren't giving yourself permission to really say yes. That's not you, or let me rephrase that. You're not being authentic in that moment, right? Or if you really wanted to say no, but you said yes. And so we all do this all the time from conditioning, from wanting to be liked, to be accepted, to be loved. But if we can just keep tuning into what's my truth? And you had used the word wisdom, you know, that the truth is, is, is the wisdom as well. And it's, it's not coming from my head. It's coming from my heart and my body. And so I'd love to invite people to listen more from their hearts, more from their bodies, which means they have to slow down and really ask what is really true right now? What is, what is my truest desire? Um, Or what do I love? What do I love so much that I'm willing to fight and protect? And then aligning with that, that's authenticity. And you do have love as one of the inner game skills. It's number four. And I love that, Carly. Thank you (laughs) for including (laughs) love there. So talk to me about the inner critic. This sounds very much like uh, psychology to me. Do you have these four main types of critics? You mentioned them, the imposter, the uh, perfectionist the boss and the pleaser. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about them for a moment. Sure. And there, you know, there's so many inner critics and there's lots of other teachers and whatnot that have identified many, many more, but I am a fan of less is more. And so. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So these are the ones that I have seen show up the most in my clients that I've worked with and supported and served as a coach and as a facilitator and teacher, but they're also the ones I see in myself. And so basically, you know, just to encompass the inner critic, we, we all have the inner critic and the inner critic is really here to protect us. That that's, that's why they're here, but sometimes they can be really very, very fear-based, irrational, um, panic-driven sometimes. And so the relationship that I try to develop, and I am still growing with this one, is I like to think of like having, um, having my inner guru and my inner critic. And they're very opposed in their views. But if I can allow myself to lead from my inner guru, 
usually things are going to work out much better. I'm going to come for more wisdom, for more love, for more generosity. But if I am allowing the inner critic to rule and lead, then it's usually a lot more fear-based, more scarcity-focused, um, more delusional. And, and it's usually all in the mind. You know, it's, it's all mind-focused. And the reason I talk about it in that way is because I've studied the mind a lot in the last 15 years, neuroscience. And our brains are malleable. So even though we have an orientation to look for the negative, because that's how we survive to being here, we can train our minds to lead from more love, to look for the good, to develop more generosity, more wisdom. Um, and that that's the opposite of the inner critic. But first we have to recognize that the inner critic is here. And so that's just developing a relationship. When you notice that you're going into what's the worst thing that could happen, oh, then you know the inner critic is leading the show. Yeah, because it's fear-based, yeah, as you said. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's easy to tell, isn't it, Carly? When we are driven, acting, uh, speaking from that place of fear mm -hmm. rather than love. But I know that fear also has a purpose, right, to protect us. Is that amazing dance? Uh, there's... Um, being out of balance and then back to balance, back to center. It's just an amazing thing in life. Definitely. And I, you know, as people are listening to it, I just wanted to give them a small, a small way to work with the fear. I mean, it's important that we acknowledge it's here. It's important that we recognize it's trying to protect us, as you just said. Um, but if we, if we don't actually say, I see you, I hear you, you know, tell me, what do you need? If we don't do that, then we might push it away. We might, you know, put it under our armpit or whatever we like <laughs> to do, you know. Um, but it doesn't go away. It, it'll keep coming back stronger and stronger until we've really said, I hear you. Why don't you just jump in my lap? Let's just calm you down. It's okay. I'm right here, right? <laughs> I love the way you say these things. <laughs> dealing with fear is almost like dealing with the puppy or with the baby. Yeah. <laughs> that <Yeah>. is great. <laughs> I love that too. So we're almost at the end. I have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. But before that, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? I'm just going to randomly pick a page. Yeah, yes. It sounds good. Intuitive. Oh, that's so funny. We've been talking a lot about love right now. And yes. the page that I just <laughs> picked mm. is the inner game practice, loving kindness, be the love. So it's actually just a small experience to lead people through. So find a quiet, comfortable place to sit. Sit up tall, but in a relaxed, comfortable posture. Close your eyes. And bring to mind someone for whom you already have a lot of love and affection for. Notice how they appear to you. You can silently say their name. And when you feel ready, send this person loving kindness by repeating these phrases. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy in mind and body. May you be happy. May you feel all the love in your life. May you love and accept yourself as you are. May you share your love well. Notice what's happening in the mind and the body and the heart. After saying these phrases, sending this love to this person and imagining how they might receive these phrases of well-wishing. And just let yourself really feel the sensations of that. Thank you, Carly, again, for your wisdom, your beautiful work, um, your purpose in this realm, for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? 
I would make sure to just really gather all the people in my life that I really love and care for and just let them know how much they mean to me and how grateful I am for them. I would, I would do even more of that. And I would fly back to California where I have some deep soul family who I haven't seen for a few months and just shower them with love. <laughs> yeah, that sounds beautiful. And so it's reconnecting, really, going back to that, what we talked, love, connectivity, right? Mm-hmm. What are three things about life you know for sure as of now? This is such a big question, Valerie. <laughs> let, me, let me just drop into huh. it a little bit. What do I know for sure? Yeah. Well, as we've been talking about, I know that the that the strongest frequency for healing that we can all tap into is love. That is undeniable. I know that if we can really cultivate the mindset of generosity, of wisdom, and of love, we can really heal this world and the workplace in phenomenal ways. And we don't all need to do it. Like even if 3% of the population was willing to do that and be the change and lead, we would see huge ripple effects of harmony, of goodness, of grace. And that's why I wrote this book. I'm, I'm so excited to see how it will inspire people to shift. And three, we are of the earth. We are not separate from her. And therefore, we must protect her. Yes, forever. <laughs> to everything you say. Thank you so much again. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Thank you. Well, my website is carlyhauk.com, C-A-R-L-E-Y-H-A-U-C-K.com. And I have a podcast as well where I interview leaders, game changers, spiritual teachers, scientists on the topic of conscious leadership at work in the world. And if you'd like to find me and to listen to some of what I'm sharing, you can go to leadfromlight.com. When you go to that website, you'll get a free handbook on how to be a conscious leader, but you'll also be subscribed to the Shine Podcast And you'll hear about all the wonderful events that I am putting together for my book that will be out in six and a half weeks. (laughs) Congratulations. And I'll have those links. I'll have all of them on your podcast profile, too. Thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you, Carly. And we'll talk soon. Bye for now. Sounds good. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Carly Hauk and her work, please visit carlyhauk.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.